All right, I think we can start. So um, I've got nearly 80 people here. Um, welcome to what is, I guess, the first official uh, online neuro theory forum uh, today with Blake Richards, uh, who's done all of his undergrad work in Toronto, uh, where he's worked with Jeff Hinton and was exposed to machine learning, um, which I guess shaped him a little bit because although he afterwards did a PhD uh, in an experimental lab uh, in Colin Ackerman's lab in Oxford and then went to another experimental lab to Paul Franklin uh, again in Toronto, he soon after returned or never left, I suppose, machine learning uh, in his own lab, uh, which he started in 2014 in Toronto, and uh, uh, then moved just recently to McGill and Mila uh, in Montreal in 2019. Uh, Blake has been interested or has been uh, become known for um, looking at deep learning with biological components uh, and also as such looking at plasticity and multiplexing in neuronal networks. Um, and so we're excited today to hear about uh, synaptic plasticity and bursting spike codes. So without further ado, thank you very much, Blake, for uh, showing up and uh, and giving us this uh, talk today. So without further ado, I'll mute myself. Great, thank you very much, Tim. And uh, I hope I'm coming through loud and clear to everyone there. Let me know if any problems arise. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to be uh, speaking at the Oxford Neuro Theory Seminar Series, though from afar in these surreal times. Um, <laughs> I wish I was there in Oxford, in fact. Well, although actually I, I also hate travel, so I suppose I'm happy to also be doing this in my pajamas, but um, <laughs> it uh, is nonetheless uh, a shame not to see Oxford in person. Anyway, um, so yes, indeed, as Tim mentioned, I'm interested in machine learning and in particular the interse intersection between machine learning and neuroscience. And one of the things that uh, my lab has really focused on over the last few years is to try to think about how biological systems might solve some of the problems that we already know how to solve in machine learning, most notably something I call the credit assignment problem. And that's partially basically what I'm going to be talking to you about today, but I'm going to take a different path than I sometimes take in, in other talks, uh, though this uh, is something I've tried out once before and I think it worked well. Um, so uh, yeah, we're, let's just jump into it maybe. What I'm actually going to do though is I'm going to start by highlighting for you where we're going to go. So um, we're going to get here the, the, the kind of objective of the talk signposted and um, I hope to make clear why I go where I go in the end of the talk. So I want to start with the question of what does it mean to learn? So when we talk about learning, it's a word that we use with very little concern. It doesn't seem like a problematic word, but I think that people often fail to appreciate what learning as a word actually implies and how we use it. And in particular, what I would argue is that learning necessitates a normative perspective. When people talk about learning, they are necessarily implying a some kind of normative metric. So for example, when we say that, you know, my kid is learning to ride his bike, we mean something very normative about that. We mean that there is a specific behavior that we would identify as good riding of a bike, that is staying up on the bike's two wheels and moving forward, successfully stopping when stopping is required, turning when turning is required, etc. And we would judge whether or not the child has learned to ride a bike based on how close they are to this behavior that we've identified as good. And when we say they're learning, we mean they are getting closer to this behavior. So <clears throat> learning importantly does not mean any kind of change. It means a very specific kind of change, a kind of change that has some normative metric to it. And within machine learning, we typically use loss functions or cost functions or objective functions, whatever you want to call it, to 
provide us with a normative metric for our learning systems. And I would argue that this is a perfectly appropriate thing to do, um, not only in machine learning, but also in neuroscience. So within neuroscience, what we would do is we would identify some function of behavior where if we're using a loss function, when the function is high, the behavior is not good. And when the function is low, the behavior is good. And of course, this is a function of the synaptic weights in the network. So the ideal thing to do would be to move to a place in synaptic space where we have a low loss function. And um, I would argue that this is a very useful model for learning in general. Um, now, <clears throat> one of the things that I think is important also to realize though, if you are willing to go as far as you've gone, as I've gone so far with this, uh, that uh, then necessarily we have the following situation. Even though the brain probably doesn't do full on gradient descent, even though it does not necessarily do back propagation of error and follow exactly the steepest slope downwards on some specific loss function, we do know that brains are capable of reducing loss functions. If I were to measure, say, my son's ability to stay stable on his bicycle, which can be something I can quantify, he will get better according to that metric. And um, that is something I can measure over time. And the fact that his brain can guarantee just through effort that he will get better on that metric over time is I think pretty remarkable. And one of the things that's important to note about that is so even though he may not be following the gradient exactly of this loss function, so as his synapses update, as he's learning this skill, it's not necessarily the case that he is following exactly the steepest direction. Necessarily, he must be at least going partially in the direction of the loss gradient. If he was not, he would not get better by definition. So um, this is a figure I borrowed from a great paper by uh, Raman and O'Leary. It's actually now out, uh, sorry, in PNAS, uh, so that I should update that archive thing. Um, and their paper is actually about something different. It's about noise in neural networks and how that impacts learning. But I like this figure because it illustrates something that I think is important, which is that if we imagine the synaptic weights at time zero, and the synaptic weights at time t, and we have some loss function, and the gradient of that loss function is, say, this direction. Um, by the way, let me know, I'm using my arrow as a pointer here. Um, let me know if that's not actually coming through on the uh, transmission here. Yeah, uh, we can see it. You can see it, good, okay. So uh, the if the loss gradient is this direction, the plasticity that goes on might not be perfectly along the loss gradient, but necessarily, so even though there might be some task irrelevant plasticity that occurs, if we look at how the weights change from time zero to time t, and the loss function went down between time zero and time t, necessarily this overall path that the synapses took in synaptic weight space must not be orthogonal to the gradient. If it, if it were, we wouldn't be getting better at this task. So um, we know that we have to be at least partially correlated to the gradient. Um, but in addition to being correlated to the gradient, there's a question of how well correlated to the gradient you are and whether you have very high variance in your uh, tendency to be non-orthogonal to the gradient. Um, and one of the things that we can say, again, with some amount of confidence is that uh, Barring some new algorithms that we have yet to discover or don't understand, something totally beyond our ken right now, um, algorithms that more closely adhere to the loss gradient will tend to learn faster than those that don't. So if we look at, for example, algorithms like node perturbation or weight perturbation, where you randomly uh, add some noise to the activity or to the synapses, and then you basically just keep uh, you know, perturbations that reduced your loss function, um, that will in fact be an unbiased estimate of the loss gradient, but it will have very high variance to it. And it will have a variance that will uh, scale with the size of the network. 
Um, and so this is a plot from a paper by Z and Sung where they're looking at the speed of learning uh, for online gradient method means uh, like full gradient descent. Here we've got node perturbation and weight perturbation. And what you can see is that the number of training examples required to achieve uh, low loss with online gradient descent is uh, much fewer than those required from node perturbation or weight perturbation. Mm. Uh, it looked like someone just raised their hand. Yes. Um, so I, I was just I just had a question about uh, like there's a lot of um, literature recently which says that stochastic gradient descent actually um, so just like um, stochastic gradient descent actually does uh, learns faster than. Uh, than uh, a full gradient descent uh, because it, it doesn't just like uh, it, it doesn't matter that you follow the gradient that well. Uh, so no, it's, it's not true that it doesn't matter that you follow the gradient that well. Um, that's a misinterpretation of what that literature shows. Now, Andrew would be able to say something about this more than me. It, so it, you must on some level follow the gradient at some point in time in your learning. I think what we can say though, is that what I'm talking about here is the specific case of your training data that you're actually updating the gradient on. There are additional considerations when you look at your test error, so data points you haven't seen yet, and especially when you start looking at tasks you haven't seen yet, so out of distribution learning and stuff. Um, then, you know, when you look at, say, for example, meta learning and you learn over many tasks, on any given task, a learning algorithm might not follow the gradient perfectly, um, but it does have to follow the gradient at some point. And in an empirical practice, you know, you can test this yourself, like literally just uh, take a network, program it with backpropagation of error and inject noise on your weight updates and if, uh, or inject some bias and you will be able to break your learning if you inject enough noise or variance. So there, there has to be some linkage to the gradient at some point. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, Okay, so my bold or ridiculous claim, depending on your perspective, is that uh, until someone demonstrates efficient learning in non-toy tasks without using any gradient information, I think it's reasonable to think about potential physiological substrates for gradient calculations in the brain. And, uh, you know, I, I think this is, this is worth emphasizing. People get angry when I make this uh, statement, but <laughs> I don't really see why it seems so banal to me. If you believe that there are non gradient based ways to learn that would be superior, then all you need to do is demonstrate it. <laughs> um, but there's a reason that we keep using gradients in machine learning, and that's that they work well. Uh, and so uh, I think it's at this point in time, still reasonable to think about how the brain might have some hook on gradient information. Even if it's not doing full gradient descent, how does my son's brain ensure that he actually gets better at keeping his bike upright over time? I think it's possible that his brain actually has some sort of calculation that goes on that actually provides some direction as to whether the gradient is in his synaptic weight space, even if it's not perfect gradient descent. So, my talk today is gonna to describe how a burst dependent synaptic plasticity rule, when coupled with the unique properties of apical dendrites in pyramidal neurons, actually enables estimates of gradients in hierarchical circuits, i.e. a form of deep learning. Okay, so just some recognitions here. This is work done in collaboration with uh, these four dudes. Um, in particular, uh, this project grew out of uh, a conversation that I had with Richard No, who's at the University of Ottawa. Um, and uh, he and I met uh, a few years ago, back when he gave a talk in Toronto. Um, and he was talking about his burst multiplexing work. And uh, I kind of immediately was like, this is what I've been looking for. And so we chatted and uh, it's been a really fruitful collaboration. Um, his student, Alexandre Payeux, uh, has been uh, the co-lead on this with my student, Jordan Gurdjieff. And um, we also uh, got some help from Friedman Zenke on this and uh, it really has been a great collaboration. Okay, so 
uh, burst dependent synaptic plasticity. Um, so there's various literature demonstrating that uh, the sign of synaptic plasticity can be altered by a high frequency burst in a postsynaptic cell. So, so what I'm going to do now, just FYI, is I, I gave you the intro to the outro there, but now we're going to go bottom up rather than top down. So, okay, at a cellular level, switch your minds to cellular level considerations for a moment. We know that, uh, yeah, as I said, a high frequency burst, which by which I mean, you know, action potentials occurring uh, rapidly one after another, say with an interspike interval of less than 20 milliseconds or so, um, can alter the sign of synaptic plasticity. This has been shown by a few papers, but this is one nice, very clear example from Letzkis et al back from 2006. So here they're patching a presynaptic cell, a uh, postsynaptic L5 dendrite, and a, uh, the postsynaptic L5 cells uh, soma. And what they show is that if they do a uh, standard um, plasticity induction, induction protocol um, with pre, before, post, they actually get long-term depression in that synapse from the L2-3 neuron to the L5 neuron. Uh, whereas if they induce, induce bursts uh, in the L5 neuron um, by depolarizing the L5 dendrite enough, then they can, uh, in fact, turn that long-term depression into long-term potentiation. So you get a flip in the sign of plasticity from negative to positive as a result of the presence of the burst. Um, so inspired by this and inspired by a couple other papers, um, we formulated a synaptic uh, update rule for cellular level models uh, as follows, which we call burst dependent synaptic plasticity or BDSP. Um, so it's very simple, really. Uh, it's illustrated on the right here in this image. Essentially, um, in order to engage in plasticity, you have to have a presynaptic input that occurs at some point before uh, a postsynaptic uh, event because there's an eligibility trace that determines whether or not the synapse is eligible for update. This is all very standard synaptic plasticity model kind of stuff. Um, but What's different is that we do not determine, say, different reg with respect to, say, spike time dependent plasticity, is we don't determine the sign of plasticity based on the timing of a postsynaptic spike relative to the presynaptic spike. Instead, the sign of the plasticity is determined effectively by whether or not the postsynaptic cell, and not the presynaptic cell, note, uh, engages in a high frequency burst. So whether or not the presynaptic cell bursts, um, if the postsynaptic cell only elicits a single spike, you get long-term depression. Whereas if the, no matter what the presynaptic cell does, whether it bursts or spikes, if you get a burst in the postsynaptic cell, you get long-term potentiation. And this is ultimately described with this uh, equation here. So here's our change over time in the synapse between neuron I and neuron J. Here's our learning rate, eta. Um, this variable here, B of I, indicates whether or not the postsynaptic cell engaged. So I is the postsynaptic cell here, J is the presynaptic cell. Um, this indicates whether or not the postsynaptic cell engaged in a burst. PI bar here is the running average of the burst probability. That is basically just it's a count over time of how many bursts uh, the postsynaptic cell has engaged in. And so this acts as a sort of homeostatic mechanism to some degree, um, you know, as the number of bursts increases, the strengthening of the synapse decreases uh, and vice versa. Um, this variable here, E, is what we call the event variable. It indicates whether or not the postsynaptic cell engaged in either a spike or a burst. So it is one if either a spike or a burst occurred in the postsynaptic cell at time step t. Um, and then uh, we have our presynaptic eligibility trace. So this is just uh, a effectively a um, low pass filter of the events 
uh, from the presynaptic cell. So whether they are spikes or bursts, um, we filter that trace and then this is our eligibility trace. So this is our weight update. So it's relatively simple um, because what's gonna happen here is if there is no burst, so you have a single spike, E is gonna be one. Uh, so you're gonna get a negative term for your weights. Whereas if you have a burst, um, this is gonna be one. And so these are always between zero and one, this term. So necessarily this is then potentiation. Okay. Now, a few interesting things about this uh, rule. One of the things that we observed, which I think is neat. So these are based on simulations using biophysical cells. So, you know, the full uh, integrate uh, integration of uh, numeric integration of voltage over time, uh, filtered synaptic inputs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things that we find is that uh, when we run a spike time independent plasticity protocol, where we pair presynaptic spikes with postsynaptic spikes that follow soon afterwards, like 10 milliseconds afterwards, uh, or I, I forget if it was exactly 10 milliseconds, I'd have to look at the write up again, but something like that. Um, what we see is that uh, whether or not we get an increase or a decrease in the weight depends on the frequency with which we pair those spikes. And this is something that has been reported in the spike time independent plasticity literature previously. Um, and I think this is interesting because, because effectively what this tells you is that you would kind of look at, you, you could take this rule and you could run a spike time independent plasticity protocol on it. And it would look like what you get from spike time independent plasticity rules, but you get the frequency dependence for free without having to have any additional modifications to the rule. It just drops out of the fact that at some point, you start to get something that looks like bursts and that leads to potentiation out of your rules. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting about this rule is what it ends up producing when you give Poisson-like uh, spiking in the cells is something that looks a lot like the beanstalk cooper monroe rule. Um, effectively, uh, the rate of the postsynaptic neuron is going to determine uh, whether or not you have potentiation or depression, but there is this sliding threshold on that rate based on that uh, running average of the burst probability. And um, so as the cell is more active, that threshold gets bumped up and um, you get this sort of BCM-like behavior out of the rule. And that's interesting because again, B BCM can replicate some interesting findings from the literature, though it also doesn't replicate others. So just to clarify, this synaptic plasticity rule is not BCM. We're just saying that it can look like BCM under certain uh, experimental conditions. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to talking about the apical dendrites because these end up becoming a key part of the story for this learning rule. Now, the reason they're a key part of this story for this learning rule is because of the nonlinear properties of apical dendrites. So um, this is a slide that I use in many, many talks. Um, one of the papers that uh, really impacted me, I'd say the most in my academic career was this 1999 paper by Matthew Larkham. Um, so he did these experiments where he patched uh, individual pyramidal cell, a uh, layer five pyramidal cell at different points uh, along the apical trunk. So at the soma, uh, early on in the apical trunk and then way up at the apical tuft. And he would uh, stimulate uh, in this particular uh, figure, he would stimulate the red electrode up at the apical tuft shown in this eye stem here. And what he found was that if he gave a little bit of stimulation such that he got a voltage, a depolarization at the apical tuft, but one that was not sufficient to trigger a nonlinear response, the passive propagation of that EPSP was very weak. And by the time you got to the soma, you basically saw nothing from it. In contrast, if he provided enough stimulation to the apical trunk, then he could trigger this nonlinear plateau potential, so named because it lasts for a long time, uh, as a result of calcium channels in the apical dendrites. And that Plateau potential was more than enough to induce depolarization at the soma. In fact, it induced high frequency bursting at the soma. Now, um, 
In fact, what Matthew then went on to show in that paper and a couple others, and which I think is illustrated nicely with these simulations as well from Adam Shai. Um, so these are biophysical simulations of a pyramidal neuron um, fit to, to real data. Um, what this ultimately means is, you know, so, so here the level of depolarization in this experiment was probably unrealistic. That's not something that neurons are going to generally see, but um, a far more realistic physiological way to get a plateau potential is actually to have simultaneous uh, inputs to the apical tuft and to the parasomatic region. And uh, this leads to something called backfiring, which um, basically means that the combined depolarization from the apical tuft and the uh, parasomatic region induces that nonlinear response in the apical dendrites. So we can see that illustrated in the simulations here. So in this simulated neuron, they're getting a bunch of synaptic inputs in the apical dendrites and in the basal dendrites. And what they find is that if they give inputs just to the apical dendrites, they can induce a single spike in this pyramidal neuron. If they introduce inputs just to the apical tuft, they don't get anything because of that lack of passive propagation because of the segregation of the apical dendrites from the soma. Um, whereas if they input basal and apical tuft inputs at the same time, they can trigger one of these nonlinear plateau potentials and get a high frequency burst out of the simulated cell. So um, the way you can think of this is effectively that the presence of basal inputs alone will lead to individual spikes generally. The presence of apical inputs alone will generally do nothing from a spiking transmission perspective. But the combined uh, inputs to basal and apical dendrites will lead to a high frequency burst. So the burst is effectively a sign of conjunctive inputs to the apical and basal dendrites. And this is just showing that it's dependent on the calcium ion channels in the apical dendrites. Okay, so what's cool about this then from our perspective, from that learning rule that we just described, is if bursting determines the sign of plasticity in the synapses, and if apical dendrite inputs paired with basal dendrite inputs determines whether or not a high frequency burst occurs, what you've got then basically is that the apical dendrites are going to act as a teaching signal effectively. They are going to instruct the synapses as to whether or not they should engage in long-term potentiation or long-term depression. So that's illustrated with this biophysical simulation we've got here. So we've got a simulated uh, layer five pyramidal neuron um, that projects to another simulated layer five pyramidal neuron. Both of them are receiving uh, apical inputs, but um, the this bottom green one here is also receiving basal inputs. And uh, essentially <clears throat> what we do in this simulation, which you see on the left here, is we inject some steady amount of current into the uh, perisomatic region of this green cell. Um, that causes it to spike, which will also help to depolarize uh, this pink cell here. Um, and so as a result, both of them will have non-zero event rates. But now whether or not the pink cell is bursting is going to determine whether or not this synapse potentiates or depresses according to our BDSP rule. So what happens now is that if we inject current into the, if we inject inputs into the uh, distal apical dendrite of this pink cell, that leads to an increase in the uh, bursting. Uh, so that's actually shown here. So this, this red line here is the bursting minus the, uh, uh, the long running average of burst probability. And so when we give those apical inputs, that shifts to positive. And the result is that this weight, which uh, we're plotting here, the change in this synapse, this weight starts to potentiate. When we then remove the apical input um, or move it back down, I should say, to the baseline level, the synapse then goes back to its original level. If we then reduce the apical input to this cell, we can then depress this synapse. And again, when we remove it, the synapse will then go back to its normal state. 
Note though, however, that if we alter the apical inputs to the green cell here, we don't change the synapse because it is not the presynaptic cell, but the postsynaptic cells bursts that determine whether or not the synapse potentiates or depresses. So the framework that we have here now is basically that the apical inputs to the postsynaptic cell can act as this teaching signal saying, potentiate your synapses, depress your synapses, send them back to normal, et cetera. Um, and the reason that this then becomes particularly cool is because of this finding, this was the finding that I saw Richard present a few years ago and which got me really excited. This finding of Richard's, uh, which he called um, burst multiplexing. So here's the idea, let's say, uh, we take an ensemble of pyramidal neurons. So these are biophysical simulations that Richard ran. Um, so we've got a group of pyramidal neurons here that uh, are fit to biological data. They're receiving somatic inputs and basal inputs. And then we can talk about the burst rate and the event rate across the population. Uh, as well as the burst probability. So let me explain what these numbers mean now when we're talking about ensembles. So if we're talking about an ensemble, the event rate is basically the measurement of what percentage of the neurons in the ensemble at any point in time are engaged in either a spike or a burst. So that's illustrated here. So here we see the voltages of three of the neurons in the simulation, and we're gonna plot the burst probability and event rate for those three neurons. So at the first time step here, the neuron one engaged in a burst, but neuron two and neuron three didn't do anything. So the event rate is gonna be one out of three. Um, in contrast, when we uh, have, look at this time window, we now have two of the cells engaging in a burst or a spike. So the event rate is two out of three. And then here, all of the neurons are engaging in some event. However, uh, when we look at the burst probability across the ensemble, that is the percentage of neurons that are engaged in a burst, at the first time step here, the only neuron that engaged in an event was bursting. So the burst probability is one, uh, which is plotted here. Here, half of the neurons were engaged in a burst, so it's half, and then here, one third of them were. And the important thing to note is that, so the way that Richard generated these, this particular si simulation is by injecting increasing input to the somatic compartments of these neurons and decreasing input to the apical dendrite compartments of these neurons. And you'll note that what's happening is that the event rate is encoding the input to the somatic region and the burst probability is encoding the input to the dendritic region. And you can see that very clearly on this plot here. So here he's introducing opposing waves to the apical dendrite and the somatic region. And the event rate of the ensemble is encoding the inputs to the soma. The burst probability of the ensemble is encoding the inputs to the dendrite. And interestingly, the firing rate just looks like a bunch of junk. So uh, the idea here is that maybe we actually gain something by thinking not just about the firing rate of neurons, but specifically by these distinct metrics, the event rate and the burst probability across an ensemble of neurons. Um, now, one of the things, oh, and, and so we call this, he called this multiplexing because the point is that out of a single spike train across a group of neurons, you're encoding two simultaneous signals that are actually kept separate for you. Um, Furthermore, though, what's interesting is you can then wire up these ensembles together in order to uh, get multiplexing across a hierarchy of cells. Um, now, what this requires, interestingly, is some distinct short-term uh, synaptic plasticity dynamics at distinct synapses. So in particular, if uh, the perisomatic projections to a neuron are short-term depressing. And if there is also the presence of feedforward inhibition onto the parasomatic region, where the neurons, the interneurons, the inhibitory interneurons also have short-term depressing synapses, what's gonna happen here is that what gets communicated to the parasomatic region is actually just gonna be the event rate itself. 
because basically anytime a spike or a burst occurs, the combination of the short-term depressing synapses with the uh, short-term depressing feedforward inhibition is going to mean that the cell will respond to events and sorry, to single spikes and to bursts uh, pretty much identically. So you're going to be receiving the event rate at the parasomatic region. In contrast, if you have short-term facilitating synapses in a feedback pathway from the pink cells here onto the apical dendrites of these green cells, and you also assume some interneurons that themselves also have short-term facilitating synapses, what's going to happen is that you're actually going to communicate the burst rate uh, through to the apical dendrites. And that is, again, for similar reasons, because as you get a high-frequency burst, these facilitating synapses are going to pick that up and, and communicate it uh, more effectively than they would a single spike. Um, so you're going to end up getting the burst communicated to the apical dendrites. And so the result is that when you wire two groups of neurons up together like this, and then you inject some current into the somatic regions of these neurons and the dendritic regions of these neurons, and you measure their burst probability and their event rates, what you see is that the, so here we're injecting uh, sinusoid um, with a uh, two hertz, uh, sorry, a one hertz, no, two hertz period to the perisomatic region of these cells. And you can see that encoded in their event rate. And notably, you also see that encoded in the event rate of these cells. So they have successfully communicated their, uh, this, this IS signal up to this group of cells. Meanwhile, the dendritic inputs to this cell is going to drive the burst probabilities in that ensemble, according to this slower sine wave. Um, and what you see when you look at the burst probability uh, in the cells below here is that though they are also to some degree tracking the event rates because necessarily that's uh, required for the backfiring, they're also being modulated by this signal. So the information about this slow sine wave being injected into these dendrites is also preserved in the burst probability of these dendrites. So you've successfully communicated these two signals past each other without uh, too much interference. And this is just an illustration of that uh, over multiple runs, averaged across time. Um, and what you see is again, the event rate being encoded both in these cells and these cells, uh, sorry, the event rates encoding this signal and the burst probabilities containing information about this signal. Now, what we then find is that if we combine these two facts, we can actually do hierarchical credit assignment using our burst dependent synaptic plasticity rule in ensembles of pure mill neurons. And by credit assignment, I mean um, basically providing a signal to all the neurons about how they should change in order to improve on some task. In other words, a hook on the gradient. So here's a very simple example uh, with XOR training. So we've got groups of biophysical neurons being simulated here, uh, arranged in this hierarchical structure. And um, we start off in this simulation with distinct feedback pathways from an output group of neurons. Uh, one uh, group receives positive inputs from this. Another group receives on balance negative inputs from this. Um, and these are these are biophysical simulations, so this is done with uh, you know inhibitory neurons, etc. And then what we do is we inject um, current into these input neuron ensembles here uh, to activate either input one by itself or input two by itself or both of them together, etc. And so we get zero zero one zero zero one 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 for a sort of standard Boolean uh, function, and um, uh, then what we do is we provide a teaching signal where we just increase the input to the apical dendrites of these neurons when we want this output neuron to be active and we decrease the apical inputs to these neurons when we want them to be silent. And what happens is that before training, basically here is the output neuron, the dotted line, the output neuron ensemble. You uh, at first have a low response to zero, zero, and then the same response to all the other inputs. But after training, um, and this is all done in continuous time, we're just injecting currents into these cells. You now get a higher response to one, zero, or zero, one, and a lower response to zero, zero, or one, one. So you can successfully solve XOR 
um, just using BDSP in these neurons and um, by giving a signal to these apodendrites, indicating when you want it to be increased or decreased in the response. Um, this is just uh, showing how the teaching signal is actually affecting the burst probability. Basically, at the end of seeing one of these uh, things that we don't want it to respond to, we decrease the burst, burst probability by decreasing the teaching signal. Um, when we want it to respond, we increase the burst probability momentarily by increasing the teaching signal. Um, and this is just uh, showing how that gets propagated in the into the burst probabilities in these hidden layer neurons. So their burst probabilities are carrying this teaching signal, and that is what allows them to engage in differential plasticity. Um, but critically, these burst probabilities are flipped in sign because this on average is inhibiting these cells and this on average is um, exciting these cells. And so the result is that you get these, these differences in the way that um, plasticity is actually being implemented in these cells, which is key to actually solving the XOR task is having different responses in the two different hidden neuron ensembles. And we can show, for example, that if we don't have the training in the hidden layer neurons, uh, you don't actually get uh, an XOR solution here. Okay, now, but solving XOR is like yawn, whatever. So let's uh, move on here. Now, but I think it's cool because I think what's, what's what I just want to emphasize about this is, you know, um, we know that you can only solve XOR with a hierarchical structure like this because it's a nonlinear task. And um, we know that, so it's, it's not something that like say a single layer perceptron can do. Uh, so the fact that you can achieve this nonlinear function simply by injecting current in real time in this, in a real time simulation, the biophysical simulation, um, by injecting current into the apical dendrites of this output cell, uh, output group of cells, I think is, is cool to see nonetheless. Um, okay, so estimating gradients. Um, so where we then went with this, which I think is uh, interesting, is to, to step back a little bit and look at an ensemble level model, because these biophysical models are really cool. I think they tell us a lot. They're really good for making sure that we're grounded in experimental reality. But um, part of what uh, we also wanted to do was to ask how far we could push learning with this rule. Now, one of the problems is that just those of you who do computational neuroscience will know the compute required to do full biophysical models is a biatch. And additionally, we just have the basic reality that it's harder to do the math on these things. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to zoom out to a sort of uh, ensemble level model where we consider groups of pyramidal neurons as a single unit unto themselves. So what we're imagining now is that we have a group of pyramidal neurons, an ensemble of pyramidal neurons that are collectively represented with a single set of variables representing the event rate, which I'll refer to with little e here, the burst probability, which I'll refer to with P here, and the burst rate, which is just the product of the burst probability with the event rate. Um, and the way that we calculate these things within the ensemble is that the event rate is uh, just a uh, linear summation followed by sigmoid. The burst probability is a um, similar thing, except we also have some additional recurrent inhibition uh, here within the ensemble and from other ensembles, which is indicated with this term. Um, I will explain why that's there in a moment. It's not just for sake of biological realism. It also achieves something for us in our learning algorithm. Uh, and um, this is, you can show actually not an unreasonable model of how an ensemble of neurons uh, behaves when you give inputs to its synapses uh, in the apical and basal pathways. Now, the other thing is we are going to um, assume that the feedback pathway here is mediated as well as these recurrent inputs. We're going to assume that everything onto the apical dendrites here are short-term facilitating synapses and everything onto the parasomatic region here are short-term depressing synapses. And then um, lastly, uh, the, uh, the other thing that we're going to just note here 
is because we're dealing with an ensemble and we're assuming that this ensemble also includes some feed forward inhibition, both on the feed forward pathway and the feedback pathway. When we talk about the synaptic weights between ensembles here, we're now talking about the ensemble weight. So that is all of this cumulative impact of one ensemble on another. And because there's feed forward inhibition in the ensembles, that means the weights can be positive or negative. So the weights no longer have to obey Dale's law here because they now represent the cumulative impact of multiple neurons on each other, as well as their feed forward inhibition. Okay, so here's our simple equations to model the ensemble level. This is just element wise uh, product, by the way. Um, and then uh, we did an analysis where we asked, okay, let's say we take our BDSP rule and we imagine infinite ensemble sizes, which is obviously nonsense, but it helps with the math. Uh, let's imagine infinite ensemble sizes um, and discrete time steps. What becomes of the BDSP update? Rule? Um, I think someone should mute their mic there, by the way, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what becomes of the BDSP rule when we consider this infinite limit? And the answer is that this is the weight update that we get. So um, here we have the burst probability of ensemble I, uh, sorry, of the ensembles in layer I. So this is uh, all of the burst probabilities for all of the ensembles across uh, a layer of ensembles, as it were. This is a moving average of their burst probabilities. This is the event rate of those same ensembles. And this then is the event rates from the presynaptic ensembles from the layer below I minus one. Um, so this then becomes our weight update. This is yeah the weight matrix update. Oh, yes, I've actually got these pointers here. So this is our current burst probability, our moving average burst probability, and our postsynaptic event rate and presynaptic event rates. And what we can show is that if the burst probabilities are maintained in a linear regime, meaning a linear regime of the feedback inputs. And the feedback and feed forward synaptic weights are kept symmetric. Then this rule is in fact equivalent to gradient descent on a mean squared error loss, where the error is taken as the error at some, whatever the highest layer of pyramidal ensembles is. Um, so now I'm not going to run through the math on this, but a paper will be coming out soon and you can check it out yourselves. Um, but you can actually see it. It's this equation is not radically different from the back propagation of error equation. In fact, even though this, we get this equation by taking the infinite limit of our burst time, burst dependent snap plasticity rule. This is basically akin to the error that gets back propagated um, in back propagation. If, you assume these short-term facilitating synapses, which gives you that propagation of the burst multiplexing signal, because this then ends up reflecting, it carries the information about the difference in the, the ways that the burst probabilities are changing at the highest level of the hierarchy. And so because that gets propagated all the way down through the hierarchy, this then carries that signal itself. So if you inject teaching signals into the top level of the apical dendrites, uh, then you end up getting that teaching signal, the difference between the teaching signal and what was actually going on in the bursts of the cells propagated all the way down through the entire hierarchy. And then this, um, then, you know, there is a presynaptic update term in back propagation. Um, oh, sorry. And this term, there, there's a little bit of complexity around this term um, for getting the gradient, but um, I'll leave you to read the, the paper in that. It's, it's not too far off uh, at first glance. Okay, so in order to get the burst probabilities to be in a linear regime, what we do is we use this recurrent inhibition. So we're imagining that this is like, say, somatostatin inhibitory interneurons, and we assume that their role is basically to engage in homeostatic plasticity in order to maintain the burst probabilities in a linear regime. So what we do is we train with the homeostatic rule that always pushes the voltages or the burst probabilities here back towards the center. So that if you look at the apical input to this region, and then you measure this burst probability, um, it is a sigmoid function, but it's spread out across the sigmoid function at first. So it's highly nonlinear, but then over training, 
that homeostatic rule pushes it into the center of the sigmoid so we get a nice linear regime on our first probabilities. The other thing we have to do is we have to align the feed forward and feedback weights here. How can we do that? Well, in this particular situation, we've actually, we can do this very easily. Like I myself have published other papers on looking at how to train the feedback weights and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's a lot more to be said about this potentially, but in this particular model, what we do is we use this algorithm called the Colin Pollock algorithm. And it's a very simple algorithm. So it says, if, if W is our feed forward weights and Y is our feedback weights, if we update W according to some equation where it's A plus, or sorry, then some weight decay. So there's some update to W A and then there's some weight decay on W and then you update the feedback weights Y with the same A as well as some weight decay, you're guaranteed that these weights will eventually converge to the same values. That's fairly obvious. Um, now, in some models that would potentially be difficult to do, how are you gonna update your feed forward weights with your feedback weights uh, and your feedback weights with the same term A? The thing is though, in our model, that's actually very easy to do because what our apical dendrites are receiving is information about the burst probabilities from the layers above. And those burst probabilities are what are determining the synaptic weight updates for the layer above. So the layer below and the layer above have access to the same information about the burst probabilities. So that A term just becomes this term here. And then everyone's being updated um, at least roughly in the same direction, not perfectly but roughly in the same direction. And it means that over time, you're gonna get a tendency towards weight alignment between the feed forward and feedback weights. Um, now, so what this does for us, oh, sorry, that should not be there. That's a mistake slide. So what this does for us, so here, for example, we have a, a, neuro, a, a excuse me, a network with uh, an input and then an output and three hidden layers in between where each of these uh, layers is composed of our ensemble level neuron model uh, units. And we train the network on MNIST, but we're training it just by injecting current into the apical dendrites of the top level neurons uh, that we're simulating um, during certain periods where we present an image. And um, here we're plotting the angle between the uh, feed forward weights and the feedback weights. And um, over the course of training, um, you can see that if we have the, uh, now, so the recurrent input helps a little bit with the alignment, but not actually that much, which isn't surprising because that's not really what it's designed to do. But if you add um, that Colin Pollock algorithm, you can crunch that down and get close to near perfect synaptic alignment um, in these cells between the feed forward and feedback pathway. And what that means then is when we now look, so here we're plotting the angle between our weight update, that is the weight update according to our ensemble level burst dependent synaptic plasticity rule and the weight update that true gradient descent would provide. Um, so 90 being that they are totally orthogonal to each other, in which case we would get no learning, of course, um, and zero being where they are uh, perfectly aligned with one another. What happens is over time, um, and especially when we combine both the feedback learning and the recurrent learning to linearize things for us, um, we can get ourselves down well below 45 degrees in the angle against the gradient. So we're gonna be following the gradient, not perfectly, but um, in a very high dimensional space, if we're down at you know, uh, 30, 20, uh, 15 degrees, that's pretty damn close to the gradient in fact. Um, so cool. So then we can estimate the gradient with this rule. Um, what is the result of that? Well, the result of that is that we can actually achieve decent learning on tasks that previous biologically plausible learning algorithms have struggled with. So um, my group, as, as well as uh, like in collaboration with Tim Lillicrap um, and a few other groups have found that some of the other algorithms that people have proposed for biologically plausible learning in hierarchical networks struggle when you present them with some of the data sets that are in fact standard 
course in machine learning, for example, CIFAR 10 here. Um, so in fact, you know, one of the things, one of the first, if you will, biologically plausible deep learning rules was um, from Tim Lillycrap and it was called feedback alignment. Uh, and that was where you leave the feedback weights fixed and random. And on MNIST, feedback alignment works really well. And so there was a period of time where many people, myself included, were really excited by this finding and were convinced that this was going to be the key to, un to cracking some of the issues with uh, biologically plausible deep learning. But, um, you know, what we have found and what others have found is that, uh, in fact, uh, feedback alignment uh, just doesn't cut it on uh, even CIFAR 10. So here you're looking at the training error on the right and the testing error on CIFAR 10 for um, a few different algorithms. Gray is true backpropagation. Um, blue is feedback alignment where you leave the feedback weights fixed and it kind of works, but not super well. Um, and then red is our algorithm where you have learned feedback weights and also some of the recurrent uh, uh, linearization that occurs. Um, and I should say, this is trained on this network structure. So here we actually introduce some convolutions. So it should be mentioned one aspect of biological irrealism here still is that we are assuming weight sharing in the early layers for the sake of a convolutional structure. And we can discuss later um, why or why not to do this and where this is a bullshit thing for me to have and where it's maybe okay. Uh, but I uh, just want to highlight that for you. Um, and then a series of fully connected layers. Um, the other thing that I'll just point out is here is node perturbation. You know, So I, I point this out only because I think a lot of people in neuroscience are really wedded to the idea that you can do credit assignment, you can get the gradient estimates that you need, even if they don't voice it that way, they wouldn't verbalize it that way. What they actually think in their heart of hearts or their mind of minds is that if you have a neuromodulatory input, a global neuromodulatory input, that provides rewards when things are better than expected and uh, goes down when things are worse than expected, so a reward prediction error signal or whatever, um, that this is enough to get a hook on your gradient and to ensure that normative perspective for the sake of learning. Um, well, that's effectively what node perturbation does here. We're giving a global signal saying things were good or things were bad, um, and it sucks. It doesn't even get close to handling CIFAR 10. And I think this is something that I, I, I usually don't like to be negative on certain ideas, but I do want neuroscientists to start to contend with this. I, to date anyway, I am unconvinced that a global neuromodulatory signal is sufficient for normative purposes. I, I think in our experience, uh, and also just if you think about, like if you look at it mathematically as well, it's just too coarse a signal. It's like trying to play hot or cold in a million dimensions. It's just not gonna work out. Um, now, we then wanted to test this on an even harder task, one that is kind of the considered the um, ultimate example. Can I just ask, is there a lot of noise? Well, forget it. One second. I'll be, well. Guys, please be quiet. Sorry, everyone. Um, <laughs> talking from home, you know, welcome to the new future. Uh, okay. Uh, the other thing is this, the, the kind of the, the task that is often considered the real test of some of these algorithms is the ImageNet data set. It's a huge uh, data set for categorizing images. And it's one which um, is notable in part because uh, it was the first data set that really gave us an indication of the power of deep learning approaches. And what we find is, um, you know, feedback alignment, as we previously reported with Tim, uh, just absolutely sucks on ImageNet. It doesn't work at all. Um, our BDSP rule is not quite as good as backpropagation on ImageNet, but the fact is it gets a way better hook on it. And that, that is because we are better aligned to the gradient. So you really can get better learning as a result of those things that give you that guarantee. Okay, so I'm actually wrapping up here now. Um, so some species, uh, especially humans, can learn very many things quite efficiently. Uh, and, you know, not all species are amazing learners, but I think it's safe to say that many species are, not just humans. Also, you know, I really love raccoons because they really show incredible learning capabilities, um, you know, various sorts of birds, rodents, etc. 
Um, and I would argue that, you know, it's not crazy to think this is sort of an answer to the complaint that um, people like uh, Paul Shizak have, uh, you know, I just recently debated him and I, I love his ideas and agree with him on a lot. But one of the things I would argue is that when we consider a phylogenetic revolutionary perspective, even though at first glance, it sounds weird to propose that there might be gradient signals in the brain and you're kind of like, how could evolution have come up with that? Um, arguably, let's just say for sake of, of you know, argument, that evolution did come up with it. Let's say some, some animal species successfully developed something that gave it a hook on loss gradients. Arguably, it would outperform all the other animal species. And it would, it would really show improved learning capabilities and an ability to adapt to different environments and would really kind of take over. Uh, and so I think that it's not unreasonable to think that if there were some mechanism that had evolved that, that ended up giving the animals a hook on gradients, that this would then very much so be selected for. And part of what I think we've shown here is that, you know, that mechanism could in fact have been bursts. So, so all this stuff that, that we've just illustrated, these are all based on simple, well, not simple, but basic biophysical properties. We haven't introduced any really wacky biology here, but just by taking the known biology of pyramidal neurons, you end up getting something that gives you a hook on gradients. So our work effectively provides a proof of principle as to how loss gradients can be estimated using a biologically motivated plasticity rule. And I think what's cool is that we can not only explain low level data like frequency dependent, spike time independent plasticity and recreate some other learning algorithms like BCM, um, but, and not only can we train networks in a fully biophysical simulation, but at the ensemble level, then we can actually get good learning of the sort that um, other biological learning algorithms have really struggled with. And so ideally what we now wanna do is to generate some predictions and look for experimental evidence for some of these ideas. And this model might be bullshit, but I think it's worthy enough of consideration for experimentalists to take a look at. Um, one of the most salient uh, experimental predictions in the model is that you should see different short-term uh, plasticity rules in uh, different parts of the neuron. So what, what we would expect is that any pathway that you'd consider sort of a feed forward pathway from sensory to motor should maybe show short-term depressing synapses, whereas backwards pathways, say from motor to sensory, would maybe show facilitating synapses. Um, we know that that's already the case with like the SST versus PV interneurons, which is interesting and kind of cool. But then, you know, the prediction would be that that would also hold maybe on the excitatory synapses. Um, another prediction of the model is that there should be a relationship between burst variance and error. So if you measure the bursts across a population and you correlate the variance, so not the amount of bursts, but literally how much the bursts are changing across trials, within your neurons, um, then there should be a correlation between that burst variance and the error that the system is achieving with higher burst variance corresponding to periods where there is higher error for the system. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the kind of overarching philosophical message that I wanna convey as well is that I think it's good to do both top down and bottom up computational neuroscience together. I think there's bottom up models are really important and I think they're valuable um, despite sometimes how I might sound on Twitter. I think they are critical to the field, but I think it's also important to have that top-down normative perspective. And I think we can actually do these together and have them marry each other at some point and hopefully even have them then married to experiments. So that's that. Thank you very much for listening. If you are interested in my various debates on Twitter, you can follow me at Tyrell Turing. And thank you to all our funding bodies for making this happen uh, and my collaborators, of course. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much. If you hit the key, uh, the space key, you can unmute yourself and ask questions. Hi. Uh, I saw one question. Uh, Pretty, or what was, sorry, yeah. yes. Yeah, I'm here. Um, so basically my question is um, that, uh, well, 
I, I, I know a paper from Tim's lab has shown in the past, like a couple of years ago, that when you, or at least they propose that when you actually, all, when you have LTP or LTD, you not only change um, the, the weight, but you also change the probability of release at the synapse. And that would, that means that you also change the short-term plasticity uh, um, dynamics at that synapse. Which will mean, like in your model, because you have some synapses do uh, short-term facilitation and depression, the the LTP and LTD on these synapses would change the short-term plasticity dynamics themselves. Uh, have you looked into it, or uh, do you have an idea how this uh, this would how this would change what you describe now? Uh, well, we have not looked at that. Um... Now, I'd be curious to ask Tim uh, more about that because um, I'm not actually familiar with this paper. Uh, you know, definitely in this model, we were assuming that synapses that are generally depressing remain depressing and synapses that are facilitating remain facilitating. So the question I would have and the thing that might present a complication for our model is if synapses, because it's one thing to say that the short term plasticity changes. The question is whether there's a full shift from a depressing uh, situation to a facilitating situation or vice versa. And if that is the case, uh, then it would be something we should think about um, as it, it is uh, not something we are including in the model right now. Uh, there was another hand up I saw there. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I have a question, question really about the kind of philosophy of your approach mm -hmm. and with this whole top down thing, it feels, well, it feels with what you do, you try, we're trying to de develop, well, we're trying to demonstrate that the brain can solve these kind of problems, uh, yes. like Cypher 10 or loads of difficult ML problems and get to an ML standard. But obviously there's loads in ML that's unsolved and people are kind of disputing whether what ML, the, the kind of tasks that machine learning can do, they're not really, you know, anywhere near what humans themselves, real neurons can do. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think we're really gonna be able to, as well as maybe demonstrate how the brain learns really kind of replicates, you know, models which can do what real brains can do with this approach? Well, so yeah, so, so my answer to that is, um, you know, it's true that um, machine learning models are still far away in capability from what we have, uh, what, what, what real brains can do. But I always find that a very funny critique of our approach here, because what we're trying to do is we're just trying to get computational neuroscience models up to the ML level. So here's humans, you know, here's ML, here's computational neuroscience, we're trying to push our models up to here. And so I, I, I'm not sure I see how we uh, should say that we shouldn't at least push them up to here, given that humans are better than ML models, right? Like at some level, we have to contend. This is, this is again, not everyone agrees with me on this, but here we go the core to my philosophy, ignore even the question of machine learning for a second. The core of my philosophy is a belief that one of the things we want in a computational neuroscience model, a good model of learning in the brain, is an ability to learn the sorts of things that brains actually learn. And in my opinion, if a model can actually learn the sorts of tasks that brains learn and another model can't, the model that can has more points in its, uh, in its basket, as it were, than the model that can't. And so really my goal here is not to replicate ML. I, like ultimately, I, I don't really care whether we're doing exactly what they're doing in ML. I just wanna get systems that can actually learn the things that humans learn. Now, it just so happens that at this particular moment in history, ML has had more success than computational neuroscience in achieving systems that get anywhere close to human level performance on these tasks. And so we use the tools and the conceptual advances from ML to move us there. But our goal is ultimately in this case, not to replicate ML. Our goal is to get to the 
capabilities of brains. It's just that we think that it is a promising path to use the insights from ML to get there, given that ML is closer to that right now than we are in computational neuroscience. Um, I saw another hand go up there. Hi. Um, just taking seriously that um, your framework would be a reasonable um, biological um, in, um, implementation of something like gradient descent within biological neural networks. I'm wondering if you could speculate on what kind of mechanism could bring about this teaching signal. Uh, how would a something above the network provide something reasonable to these output nodes so that you can achieve kind of normative or optimal uh, changes in the network as a whole? Um, mm -hmm. Yep. Very curious yeah. about that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I think that, you know, these are the sorts of things that I also want to start to push on and think about into the future. Now, for the record, I just also want to clarify something. Here, we're looking at supervised learning. It was our particular goal in this model. I think there's obviously a lot of unsupervised learning or self-supervised learning that occurs in the brain. In other talks I give, you know, we're actively, uh, ex like we're, I've shown data where we're actively exploring that. We've got various projects going on in, that, in the lab. So just in case anyone doubts the, they, if people are like, well, brains don't always have labels. I, I, I know that not all learning in the brain is supervised. But then there's the question of, does the brain ever engage in supervised learning? And there, I actually think probably it does. One of the things that I think is so interesting about our ability to learn is that we seem to benefit from receiving targets, right? Like, why is it good to have someone teaching you something? You know, uh, like if you are learning piano, you benefit from a teacher to sit down to you, next to you and show you, no, 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 here's what you wanna do. You wanna do bop, bop, bop. And it's because you seem to have the ability somewhere in your brain is the ability to translate what you see others doing into a goal for your own neural trajectories. Um, we see this actively actually in songbirds. Songbirds, interestingly, have uh, their, their neuromodulatory systems um, have been shown to actively track the extent to which they are successfully mimicking their parents in their songs. Um, so there does seem to be some kind of internal goal system and uh, some internal mechanism for setting targets. What that is, I don't know. Um, and I think it's something that we will hopefully explore more in neuroscience over time. I, I do think, though, that just the, the basic introspection suggests that there is some ability to set our own targets when provided with examples. Okay. Right. I, um, sorry, go for it. Um, I just wanted to ask quickly because um, I guess it's, it goes back to some of the teaching signal stuff that you've been saying. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned about teaching signal uh, sort of controlling or increasing and decreasing burst probability. Mm -hmm. At what time scale do you think this, this may happen? Or, or to learning or to developmental time scale or what kind of changes you would, you would expect? Well, so, um, you know, one of the things about time scale here is that uh, the time scale required for this learning to work depends on the number of neurons that you assume are in these ensembles. So technically the entire algorithm should work even with a single neuron in each ensemble, but then you should need a long, long time. Uh, if however, you have many neurons uh, engaged at this at once, then you don't need very long. And in fact, the bursts the burst probabilities across a large ensemble of neurons would theoretically change on the order of milliseconds um, in the uh, in the tr in the the training. So, in fact, if I um, go back, I assume my slides are still up here for everyone. Um, here, oh, actually, maybe we don't show the time scale, but we do here. So, I mean, you know, technically what we're simulating this on is in this case, because we've got just one neuron is on the order of seconds. So you can see the time scale here. So we increase the burst probability 
And then over the course of 50 seconds, there is this increase in the synaptic weights. So you could maybe take that as a baseline assumption about the time scale on this stuff, that it's on seconds. But if you have many neurons on the ensembles, you could push that down to milliseconds. If you have very few, you, you would have to have this be, be sev several seconds, many seconds uh, for the weight updates. A few more questions. Uh, Blake, I have a, a small clarification question. I just think I zoned out at the critical moment. You said something needed to be in a linear regime, uh, but clearly yes. these networks are nonlinear. So can you clarify uh, which is which? Yeah, so it's that in order for the changes in burst probability to successfully carry the error from the top level down through to the bottom level without horrible distortions of the gradient. You need to keep the burst probabilities as a function of the inputs into the apical compartments linear. So you need to, because obviously it is nonlinear, it's, um, it's a sigmoid function because we're calculating probabilities between zero and one. Um, but what we do is we push uh, the activity in the apical compartment towards uh, the midpoint in order to keep them in the linear part of the sigmoid. Um, and that, that, so that's what we have to linearize. I see. Thanks. And then the feed forward activity can still be nonlinear, whatever it happens to be. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Hi, Blake. Yep. Um, I just wanted to ask about the BDSP rule. Has it been, have you guys found out what causes the change of sign at like a biophysical level? Yeah, right. So we haven't investigated this uh, um, a huge amount, uh, but what the literature points to pretty clearly is that it, it's all about the depolarization at the postsynaptic site. So, you know, I hesitate to say this uh, at this audience, but I personally found uh, Lisman and Spruston's critique of STDP back in the day pretty convincing. You know, the fact is, I don't think that really we should be thinking about these learning rules at the biophysical level as being about spikes. These, these learning rules are motivated by things going on in the synaptic compartments. And particularly, probably the, the key question is postsynaptic depolarization. Um, and Claudia Klopath has done models of this, um, and, and there have been experiments showing that, you know, you can get potentiation even without a postsynaptic spike as long as you have sufficient postsynaptic depolarization. But of course, then there's a the question of what actually happens physiologically. When do you get sufficient uh, depolarization to get LTP versus LTD? And I think the uh, one of the the easiest ways to do that is to have a high frequency burst because that high frequency burst will back propagate into the dendrites and that will really enable um, your NMDA receptors to open. Uh, and there you go, you get LTP. Now, there might be other ways to achieve that. And indeed we know about you know NMDA plateaus um, where you get a long lasting depolarization just by virtue of inputs directly to the dendrite and you don't need a high frequency burst. And I think that would be another interesting thing to explore in the future is what happens when you consider other potential sources of depolarization. But um, the answer to your question ultimately is I suspect that bursts are critical because of their impact on depolarization in the dendrites. Thanks. Um, if I can also ask, has this rule been investigated alongside neuromodulation? So there's recent research that shows that neuromodulation can change the Yes, right. So no, we didn't incorporate that into this rule. And I think that would be really interesting to look at because indeed, you know, like when you look at deep reinforcement learning, what ultimately happens is you have uh, a situation where you back propagate your policy gradients, but then you determine whether those policy gradients uh, are, whether you do gradient descent or ascent on those policy gradients based upon um, your, uh, your neuromodulatory input effectively, your reward prediction error. And um, I think that uh, it would be uh, really interesting to look at 
models that incorporate an additional term here for neuromodulation. And it would probably be key to marry this plasticity rule with reinforcement learning. Thank you. So I was wondering about the predictions or implications your model might have on like normal models of the visual stream, because if we use say electrophysiological data, we usually use a firing rate to, I don't know, fit decoding models or encoding models. And if I understand your model correctly, um, that would imply that these encoding models might perform better if we use the event rate. And that doesn't seem like it would be impossible to get at using mm -hmm. recent or like just generally acquired data. Do mm -hmm. you think that like could constitute a reasonable improvement? Yeah, I mean, I think it's entirely possible. And in fact, I would love to see some analyses of, uh, you know, electrophysiological recordings where people examine distinctly the burst probability and the event rate, because not only based on our rule, but even just based on the work of Matthew Larkham, the, uh, the conclusion that you would draw is that whether or not you see high frequency bursts um, is going to be an indication of top down inputs, but your bottom up propagation of information might be totally unrelated to whether or not you get bursts uh, or not totally unrelated, but, but much less important for it. And so really um, if you ignore the high frequency bursts impact on the firing rate and you just look at when you get events, you might see even cleaner encoding of the visual inputs potentially. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah. I, I guess if no one else has a question, I wanted to ask uh, this bursting plasticity rule that you um, propose and that you observe does is one of the implication of this that uh, basal spikes alone or basal basally arriving spikes alone cannot induce plasticity? Uh, well, they would induce plasticity, but they would uh, always induce long-term depression. Okay, thank you. And recurrency in this model, is it? Yeah, so other than the inhibitory recur recurrence that we use for the homeostatic rule, we don't have recurrent learning in this model. Um, and recurrent circuits. Now, you know, I think that these are the next steps, in fact. Um, and uh, I think uh, a role for recurrent circuits um, in modulating the responses here would be critical. And in particular, I think an interesting question would be, and I'm not just saying this to suck up to you, Tim, um, what the uh, kind of role would be of like proper EI balance in these models if you have the things just kind of always skirting, um, uh, being successfully sort of like kept on a leash by um, recurrent signals, but then occasionally you let things pop out. Um, you might also be able to introduce some interesting recurrent learning rules as well. Yeah, I was gonna ask about uh, inhibitory synaptic plasticity there to rein in. Yeah, right, so yeah, you. no, I think there would be a lot of, a lot of stuff to do there. The only inhibitory sample plasticity we had here was that inhibit the homeostatic term on the apical dendrites. Cool, thank you. Are there any other questions? Hi, I have one more actually. Um, yeah. I was wondering. Um, I was wondering about the transmission of event rates to from the pre to postsynaptic neurons. Yeah. Um, so in your model, you assume that that at that synapse you'd have something like short term depression. So that you, I guess, yeah. but one of the things that short-term depression does is effectively filter out high frequency firing in the presynaptic population. So yeah. I'm wondering if, if you think that the, the rate of short-term depression would somehow relate to the dynamic range of the presynaptic firing rates, if that's one of kind of predictions of your framework, so that if this is to actually be a realistic yeah. as a yeah. form of, of as effective communication event, of event rates. Yep. Yep. It would have to be, it would have to be definitely like we would assume that, um, you know, the, the, in order to properly encode the event rate, it should be that at least at the physiologically realistic levels of high frequency bursts, you should get depression of the synaptic inputs. 
All right. Cool. I guess that, that's it then. So thank you very much for, um, for giving this lovely talk. And um, I guess we can all unmute and applaud again, if you can make it synchronously. Thank you.